the world is becoming darker and darker. Soon the Son of Man shall appear in glory and power, and the nation shall mourn with the sight of his coming. Are you ready for the return of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? As the armies of darkness march towards global domination, many slumber as we approach the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us awake and announce his kingdom. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. You are listening to Radio Redemption. And power! And power! Power! For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. 1 Corinthians 4.20 Hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory be to his name, glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're listening to Radio Redemption and Power. We are a South Florida radio program that preaches the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight we continue our study in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The last time we left off in the study, we were, we started getting into the qualifications of an elder, the qualifications of a bishop or a pastor. And we're seeing how important it is for God to make sure that the ones, the people that he puts into public ministry have a certain testimony in their life that reflects the character of Christ. And uh, we thank you for joining us tonight. And tonight we're going to continue uh, on verse 4, where we left off last week, and we hope that this will be a fruitful study to you if you're a person that's looking, that has a heart, uh, a desire in your heart to serve the Lord uh, in the ministry, or if you're a Christian that wants to see what is the high calling of God, because one of the things that we see is that the character that is supposed to uh, be possessed by a leader in the church is one in the likeness of Jesus Christ. He is the upward call for every Christian, and we are to follow his example. And the traits that we're seeing here in the book of First Timothy chapter 3 is Christ-like character. Remember that you can visit us on our webpage, redemptionandpower.com. We also have available now our Android app for Radio Redemption and Power. Just go into the Google Play Store and look for RRAP, Radio Redemption and Power. You can have that app now on your phone, as well as if you have an iPhone, you can get the iPhone app at the at the App Store uh, for your convenience. You can also write to us at redemptionandpower at gmail.com or find us on Facebook or Twitter or at 305-320-7727. That's 305-320-RRAP. Brother Lewis, would you kindly lead us in prayer tonight? Amen. Father God, we want to thank you for everything you have done for this wonderful ministry, Lord. And uh, we want to make a shout out to our brother Justin Fall and Mike Coop and all the people out there in Georgia. Last week we went out there and we fellowship with them and we are, uh, many things happened. Uh, friends, uh, people were touched, delivered. I myself came here motivated and uh, wonderful things to be united with the brothers. Lord, we pray for all these wonderful people, Lord, that uh, are connected to your ministry, Lord. And we pray that you tonight may minister to your people, your wonderful word in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, you're listening to Radio Redemption and Power. You can tell a lot about a man by the Does he make his home a haven, or is he filled with fear and strife? Way down deep inside of her is the story of his life. You can tell.
Does he give an ear to listen? Does he try to see inside? Will he give a strong security and arms where she can cry? You see the times we feel like giving up or holding on to pride. All the times that God is calling us to sacrifice our lives. You can tell a lot about a man by the way he treats his wife. Does he make Is it filled with fear and strife? Way down deep inside of her is the story of his life. You can tell a lot about a man by the way he treats his wife. Is it diligent and fathering, or does she feel alone? Does he know that making love to her starts before he's even home? So he calls and speaks his love to her and listens on the phone, 'cause the power of his commitment. Found in God alone. Mm-hmm. You can tell a lot about a man by the way he treats his wife. Does he make his home a haven, or is it filled with fear and strife? Way down deep inside. Is the story of this life? You can tell a lot about a man by the way he treats his wife. Way down deep inside of her is the story of his life. Praise the Lord. Glory be to His name. Hallelujah. You're listening to Radio Redemption and Power. And tonight we continue our study in First Timothy chapter 3. Uh, we started out uh, looking at what are the qualifications of a leader in the church of Jesus Christ. Because it is His church. And that's something that's very important. When He talks to Peter, and he, he tells him, On this rock I will build my church. It is His church. It is His body. And he sets the rules. And that's something that's very important because we live in a day and age where people are getting their formulas and how to do ministry uh, from, you know, different type of uh, businessmen, different types of practices that have nothing to do with the Bible, have nothing to do with the Lord, have nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. And one of the wonderful things we see is how the Holy Spirit is able to bring order out of chaos. Uh, we look in the uh, New Testament church, and the first Christians, they didn't have a Bible. They didn't have a manual that they could look to. They had the Old Testament, but they didn't have anything in which they can go by to establish a church. And we see how 
little by little, the Holy Spirit starts building up and to the point where we now have instructions in the epistles on how the church of Jesus Christ should be ordered. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing an order. What are the requirements for those who desire leadership? And we started looking at the first couple of verses last week. We saw that a a bishop must be blameless, must have a good testimony, must be a husband of one wife, must be vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, and verse three, not given to wine. We saw last, we saw the last time we uh, were in, in the study that it doesn't just necessarily apply to physical wine, but could apply to that uh, drunkenness spirit that's going on nowadays. He says, no strikers, not, uh, he's not a person that is contentious. He is not greedy, a filthy lucre, a person that wants to get gain and will do anything possible to be able to make money. And that's one of the things that we're seeing nowadays. Uh, preachers are prostituting themselves for money to be able to, uh, get richer. And it's, it's, it's a disgusting scene to be, to, 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 to witness that. And he says, but patient, not a brawler and not covetous and we start off in verse 4 which is where we left off the last time we were on the study and he says one that ruleth well his own house having his children in subjection with gravity for if a man know not how to rule his own house how shall he take care of the church of God we see here very important principles that Paul is laying down. How can a man that doesn't know how to rule his own house take care of the church of God? And this is something that's important because how can we manage what is not our own if we cannot manage what is? The Bible tells us that if we are faithful in little, put in places of greater responsibility. And the same principle applies here. God allows us to be stewards over our own homes because everything that we have belongs to God. And that same stewardship needs to be applied to the church of God. And what is a steward? A steward is someone that takes care of something that doesn't belong to them. There's a great responsibility. We see in a few parables in the Gospels where Jesus speaks about being a good steward. And what is a a good steward? That we've been left in charge of the master's house. And here, the calling to this minister, to the leader of the church is, how is your house? How do you handle your personal day-to-day life? And the first example here we see is the family. Paul says, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. See, we look at the the Catholic system, and their priesthood says they cannot have any children, they can't have families, but we don't see that in the scriptures. Always the priesthood was a head of a family, and it's not a requirement to have a family, but it takes a great deal of responsibility, something that is entrusted to every father, to every husband, is to lead that family, and God will call that person to account And here Paul is telling us that examples of godliness should be first seen in us, in our homes, in the way that we behave with our wives, in the way that we handle our finances, in the way that we raise up our children, should first speak about the godly example that is in us, in us following Jesus Christ before we even desire to take what doesn't belong to us when we start to exercise authority over the people of God. See, one of the uh, things that we see in the scriptures is that the church is called the household of God, the family of God. And when a person is called into leadership in the ministry, he is called to lead God's family. And we look at the church and we see that the church is a New Testament concept and this is something that's very important the church does not exist in the old testament 
And one of the fundamental problems that we have is when we try to apply Old Testament concepts to New Testament ones. And it doesn't work. Jesus says it's like putting on a new cloth on an old garment, which makes a tear worse. When we try to use a model of something that existed before to apply to something that didn't exist, that's completely new, completely different, we end up ruining it. And one of the principles that we're seeing here in comparison to the Old Testament where we see that God used the prophets, the priests, and the kings to lead, and 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 even though we can glean practical lessons from what they did, but when we don't see too much family involvement. For example, we look at the priest Eli in the book of 1 Samuel, and we see that his sons were corrupt. His sons were not faithful to God. They were committing wicked acts. They were taking advantage of the position that God had given them. As opposed to serving the people, they wanted the people to serve them. They were exactly like these phony preachers that we see today. We look at the prophet Samuel. Excellent prophet who was obedient to the Lord. Yet his sons were also corrupt. His sons did not follow his example. His sons were not were not godly children. We don't see that family connection. We look at David. David was, the Bible says, a man after God's own heart. He was a man that loved the Lord. He was a man that uh, was faithful to God. Even with his failings, he, he, he wholeheartedly wanted to follow the Lord and obey him in all things. And yet we look at his son Solomon, who obviously had some kind of sexual issue with the amount of women that he had. And he eventually became apostate because his heart was drawn away from God. How is it that these godly men, their children end up in opposition towards God. And it's because it was a totally different model. God dealt with the individual. He dealt as a covenant. But when we look at the New Testament, the very first thing we see is that God is reveals himself as the Father. And he sent the Son, Jesus Christ, to reveal the Father. When Jesus teaches us to pray, the very first thing he says, Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. Our Father. If you read in in the book of Psalms, an Old Testament book, it has 150 chapters, most of them written by David, who loved the Lord with all his heart. And there is not one direct address to God as Father. God reveals himself as a father. And that's the revelation that we receive from Christ. When we read the epistles, the letters from the apostles, they address the churches as fathers. We look at the letters of John, and many times he addresses us as little children. He says, little children, this term of endearment. He God is dealing with his people, with his church, as a father, as a loving father who lovingly disciplines his children if he has to. And this is something very important because if we have an Old Testament mentality and try to apply that to the organizing and the leading in the church of Christ, it's not going to work. I don't have any children yet. But I can learn from Jesus, from the apostles, and from my own father, and from those in my life that also have children. And what I've seen is that a father is someone that gives himself for others without expecting anything in return. Without expecting a favor in return. And this is something that's important. We see this attitude in Paul when he's addressing in Timothy. He says, my son in the faith. We see his letters to the churches and how he nurtures them. 
And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be married and have a family. But if you do, it should be evident there. It should be evident in our marriages that we lead our wives, that we shepherd our wives gently. And unfortunately, this is something that I failed a lot in. And something that God is teaching me in my life and the importance of seeing God as our Father, that we can approach Him as a loving God. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit allows us to be able to cry, Abba, Father. That's something that was unseen in the Old Testament. And this is the attitude that God wants the leaders to have in His church is an attitude of a father. I can think back at many sacrifices that my father has made for me. I remember um, how he left the country of Nicaragua to come over here to the United States and he worked in a car wash to be able to save up money to bring us over here because of the communist regime that had taken over the country. And I have seen many times in my life where he set himself aside to be able to help me and he's never asked for anything in return. And that is the attitude of a father. It's not one that says, come to my church and bring this amount of money. It is an attitude of a loving father. Amen. I've mentioned before that God is a God of order. And let me give you a scripture. And that is in 1 Corinthians 1440. And this is what the word of God says. Let all things be decently and in order. When we look throughout the Bible, we know that our God is a God of order. The way he created the world shows us that everything was put in place in its perfect time and perfect order. When we look at the Bible, we see that it is in order as well. We see that it starts with the beginning. It shows us what Jesus came to do for us at the cross to forgive our sins. And it shows us there's an ending at the end for some good and for some not that good. And it's not a coincidence why God would choose the family in order to show the importance of order. Why? Because in the home is where true spiritual condition is measured. In other words, you could go to church and act like something. You could be around people and act like something that someone that you're not. But at your, in your home, you can't hide these things. Whoever's in there, whether it be your wife or your son, can see your true person. That's why God brings it to the home. Now, yes, it is our responsibility to be a provider. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that we always have to earn more than our partner. A perfect example of this is me. My wife earns more than I earn. It has to do a little bit more than that. It has to do with the way that we conduct or are in our home. The way we treat our wives, how we teach our children. There is, this scripture has a very important point here where it says, he must manage his own family well. The first point. In other words, we are not people to be in chaos where, you know, we don't pay our bills or we don't, you know, we don't take care of our homes, you know. The second point is with children who respect and obey him. It is very important that our children respect us and respect God. And you know, one of the biggest problems that's happening, that's happening today, brothers and sisters, that in the home is that children are running the home. You know, there are people right now 
that a child pretty much controls their home and tells them what they're going to do and when are they supposed to do it. Children have no respect for authority. Parents can't control their children and let alone teach them in the ways of God. Why? This is not the child's fault. This is the parent's fault. Something has failed in the home. Because if from the beginning, we teach our children in the ways of God and the, the responsibility of how they need to respect us, then they wouldn't fall away from that. Listen, I remember my dad, all he had to say was one word. And everybody in the home knew that that was it. And unfortunately, that is not what's happening today in our homes. And we need to bring it back where we can have order and respect in our home. Amen. And uh, in verse 4, when he says, having his children in subjection with all gravity, the Greek word for that that's translated having actually means taking by the hand, taking by the hand. And it gives an implication of gentleness. A man of God needs to be a, a man that is gentle. And that is opposite of what the world considers a man. Uh, the world considers a man a person that is uh, a, a male that is loud and obnoxious and uh, is able to speak his mind at every single moment and he's rough and tough. But that's not the image that we see in the scriptures. A, a man of God is one who's able to have discipline and he's able to lead, uh, gently lead his family. And this is important because there is a connection between a person that's raising children and a pastor that is leading sheep or newly born Christians. A person that has been born again, the Bible calls them uh, babes, babies in Christ. And a person that has been born again, that is, is a recently converted, requires a lot of attention requires more, uh, you need to be more on top of them to teach them and to burp them and to, you know, help them to walk when they fall. And it requires a lot of patience. And if a person loses patience with their own children, how are they not going to lose their patience with somebody that's not in their family? And even though they're the, the family of God, and we see that there's a certain aspect as to how God uses the home to bring about sanctification. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be married. Paul wasn't married. He didn't have a family, but yet he had the love of Christ. He was looking at Christ and he was seeing at the love and the compassion of who he was. And his desire was to, for Christ to be seen in him. And this should be the desire of every man, because then it doesn't matter what our circumstances are. We are looking and following and desiring to be like Christ because that is the ultimate goal. Only then will be, we be able to minister in a way that is appropriate, in a way that God is pleased because we are allowing Christ to minister through us. And we have that ability to be able to do that in our homes. And it doesn't just apply to a person that governs their own house. But one of the things that we see in the scriptures is that we are called the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies belong to God. And God allows us to use our bodies. And we can either use them for the glory of God. Or we can give up our members to uncleanness, like Paul says in the book of Romans. We have the ability to honor God with our bodies. And we have stewardship over our bodies. And how can we govern God's house well if we do not have self-control in our lives. If we do not have self-control over our money, one of the things that God is operating in my life and is bringing a lot of conviction is credit card use. Irresponsible credit card use. How can I be a minister of, of God's people and any finances in the ministry of God if I'm allowing credit card debt to get out of control in my life? This is something that God has been hammering really hard into my heart. And it's true. How can we 
manage somebody else's money if we're not managing our own correctly. Our bodies and our, belong to God. Everything that we own, God has loaned it to us. And we see an example of what happens. Jesus Christ, when he speaks about the, the, the different talents, the Bible says he gives one. Uh, there's one that gets five talents, another one gets uh, two, and, and one gets one. And the one that gets the five and the other one gets two, they, they both multiply it. And the other one goes and hides it in the dust, in the dirt. And God was expecting for there to be a return on, on those resources that were given to that steward. And the same thing applies to our personal lives. Not just our finances, but also the way that we have self-control over the way we speak. If we do not have control over our mouths, how can we ask God to use us to preach? If we cannot have dominion and control over our thought life, how can we seek to help others? And this is what Paul is saying. Show the example first in your life before you desire for it to be in a position of leadership. And this is very deep because unfortunately we've become very lax when it comes to the requirements that are to be seen in someone that is to lead. We look more at talent and ability. But that's not what God is concerned about. There's many orders, people that can deliver wonderful speeches that are not saved, that can move you emotionally that could get you excited, that could get you all revved up. But that's not what God is looking for. God is looking for truth in the inward parts and in the intimacy and the things that are mundane. Is Christ there? Is Christ seen in that area of our lives? Is there some area in our life that we haven't given up over to God? Is there an area in our life where we want to have dominion over and the Holy Spirit is knocking and he's telling us and he's bringing conviction and we just won't give it up. We must surrender to the Lord and allow him to teach us how to govern ourselves, to govern our bodies so that we can have responsibility over something that's not our own. He says, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? The Bible says that Christ gave his life for the church. He purchased it with his own blood. God purchased the church with his own blood, the Bible says. He cares about the way that we deal with his people. If he finds us so precious that he would completely and wholly give himself for it, then there is an expectation of those whom he gives stewardship over his people, over his sheep. We look at sheep and they're very fragile. They get scared easily. And God has specific requirements for those who are going to be taking over his sheep. And he says, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. The most dangerous sin in the life of any Christian, and especially if you minister, is pride. And what happens is, why, why he, Paul says not a novice, not someone that's new, not a recent convert, because he, a, a recent convert hasn't been broken. He doesn't, He's not depending on the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, he may be excited. Yes, he may be filled with the, with the power of God. But if he hasn't been broken, he is no good to God. Eventually, all the ministering and the authority will get to his head and he will think of himself greater than what he is. And the Bible says that he falls into the same condemnation of the devil and that the devil will try to get himself to the position of God to be a higher position than what he was. And he was cast down. And the Bible says that God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. And when pride takes hold of a man, God is against that individual. God hates pride. 
And, and if pride has rule over our hearts, God will never be able to bless us because we will always take the credit from God. We will always be like, oh, it was me that, that did it. I did it. Look at me. It's my ability. And it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. If we're to enter into the ministry, we have to ask God to break us, to break the pride that is in us. We look at a lot of these mega church preachers. A lot of them fall into or or, or the ones that fall into grievous sin is because they were not watching in their lives. Because the root of all sin is pride. It is selfishness of trying to just fulfill my desires, looking to fulfill my flesh. And that is caused by pride. And the reason why these men fall is because they stop trusting in God and they trust in their own ability. Pride is our, is the most destructive sin in the life of any Christian. Amen. Brother Javer just mentioned that an elder must not be a new Christian. Let me just explain something to you, uh, brothers and sisters. A grown man is not like a child. Children do whatever they want, play games, and when they finish doing whatever they're doing, they'll just walk away and leave. A leader has to be somebody that has been put through the fire and could withstand the fire and strive to get to the end. But these things come through a process, and that process is the training time that we spend with God, that we walk through the deserts until we achieve maturehood. Now, let me give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Many years ago, I started going to a church, and uh, I was invited to a group prayer service, and I went a second time, and I went a third time, and, uh, you know, it was kind of nice. And then all of a sudden, one day he said, hey, you want to become a member of a church? And I said, yeah. So in the middle of the week, I get a call from one of the mentors of the church, and he said, you know, uh... Brother Lewis, I'm going to send you out and your wife as leaders. And I said, there's something wrong with these picture, with this picture. These people don't even know who I am. They haven't even tested me whether, you know, I'm even going to stick around. And yet they're putting me in a position of leadership. Well, it wasn't only with me that this was happening. It's with Everybody that went to that church, within weeks, they were sending out people, making them the leaders of a prayer group. Well, what happened was that a lot of people got tired of it and closed their cell group. Others led people in the wrong way because they didn't know what to do. They were given a scripture, said, read that, make a little prayer, collect some money, and send them home. And this was... This was what the whole thing was all about. So they had problems of people mistreating other people, abandoning the church, neglecting the sick and the needy, not caring for the homeless. That's why God is a God of order. He's not going to put out of all those people that were around the world, he didn't choose them all to be leaders. He put certain people to lead a flock. Why? Because everybody can't lead. Not everybody could be a leader. Now, everybody could mature into being a leader. However, that is a process. You have to be able to meet that. You know, being a servant of God is not like you're going to go... uh like Moses did to Pharaoh, as soon as you see, you know, the the the, the chariots and the warriors and all that, you're going to run away. 
That's not somebody that God can use. God is only going to use people that even though they have a lot of flaws and a lot of problems, perhaps they think they're nobody, but they're willing to stand with him to the end. And that's what church leaders should be like. People that God could rely on and that respect God and honor God to do what he says. Not people that when something comes up, a situation, a problem, they're going to run. We need to be mature, friends. We need to take responsibility. There's millions of people every day that are going to help. And a lot of us are sitting home and doing nothing. God did not call you to sit in a chair or a couch or in the pews. Every one of us has a job to do, and we need to get to it. Verse 7 says, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. What Paul is saying here is that this individual who is going to be a leader in the church doesn't only have to have a good testimony inside the church, but also outside the church. And when he does his secular things, what's his testimony like? And this is something very important because one of the things that exists today is that, okay, this is holy and this is not. Uh, I go to church and I'm going to give off this appearance. But then you're at work and you forget that God is also looking at you there. God hasn't disappeared. His eyes are everywhere. And he, Paul is saying it's just as important for this person to not only have a good testimony in the church, but also outside of the church. There's individuals that they act all holy in church, but then they go to work and they're foul mouth and they mistreat their coworkers and they cheat and they lie. I remember when I was a young teenager, when I was a teenager, um, I grew up, you know, I was part of one of those uh, fundamental Baptist churches and it was very, very legalistic. And I was young and I was rebellious and I was very good at putting on an act. I was very good of going along with the program because I knew that if I didn't go along with the program, there would be consequences. But in the school, I was a totally different person. And I remember at one time part of the soul winning group knocking on doors and I ended up knocking on a door who was uh, 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 on a schoolmate of mine. And this was back when I was in, in middle school. I think I was like in sixth grade. And I remember feeling so embarrassed that I didn't have the ability to really be able to tell that person anything because that person had seen me. While I was at school, I was being a total hypocrite that I didn't act any, in any way like a, a Christian. And that's what I was. I was a hypocrite for a very large portion of my life. I don't believe I was even saved. But I remember being so embarrassed when I saw that schoolmate, when I saw that fellow student, because I knew that I have never given any testimony. And that's the same thing. Uh, Paul speaking about here because if our testimony outside is a bad one because of evil practices, we would never have an authority to be able to speak and preach to the lost because we're we're going to be hypocrites, and this is the snare of the devil that makes us think that we can act one way here and act another way somewhere else. And whenever we're in hypocrisy, the devil has something in us. There's a trap there that he uses us, that he uses against us to discredit us and to strip us of any authority because we only walk in authority when we're walking in holiness and because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, wherever we walk, whatever we do is holy. When we're working, 
It is holy unto the Lord because the Holy Spirit is in us. When we're having leisure time with our families, that is holy because the Holy Spirit is in us. And when we fail to understand that and we become hypocrites, we'll never have power and authority to be able to speak in the lives of others and we'll also embarrass the church that we go to. Oh, these Christians are all the same. Hypocrites. And that's why it's so important. What is our testimony when we call ourselves a Christian? I'm not, there's obviously there's people that were converted and they had a bad lifestyle and they did bad things. And after they're converted, some people still remember that. But that's not what he's speaking about here. Paul was a individual who murdered Christians. Yet that became part of his testimony when he was changed and transformed. He didn't continue doing it. And that's the point. If we've been saved and transformed, we should have a desire to walk in holiness, to follow after Christ. And there should be changes that should be happening in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. When we live lives as hypocrites, we fall into the snare of the devil, into the trap of the devil where we become powerless to be able to proclaim the gospel. Amen. What do people say about you? When you put that into thought, that is very deep because if you were to ask somebody and that's including your family members, your father, mother, sister, brother, your wife, if you have one, or your friends, or the people that you work with, what would they say that you were like? Would they say that you are somebody who represents Christ correctly? Or would they call you a hypocrite like Brother Javer just said? You know, I was talking to a buddy of mine. His name is Mike Coop. And he told me a story about a friend that he's trying to win to Christ. But she is a Buddhist. And he said that uh, some Christian guys that were pressure cleaning her home didn't knock on the door and tell the lady that the windows were open. And somehow they got water inside her house or something like that. And the lady came out to address these guys for doing that. And they got into an argument with her. And they said, well, by the way, we're Christians. And he said to me, you know, Brother Lewis, he says, you know, everything that I had built up with this lady was destroyed at that moment. A lot of times people don't understand that when we act in the wrong way against other people, we give the wrong image of our God. So it's very important for us to live and be people who represent our God. Father God, tonight we want to thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done. I want to pray for my brother Mike Coop. Father, I pray that you strengthen him, that you give him courage to be able to go out and preach your wonderful word before senators, before presidents, and before the world. I pray for my brother Justin Fall, and for his wonderful family. I pray, Father, that you open doors for them, help them in their needs, and, Father, show him what direction you want him to go. I pray for his brother West, a man that you had given him a wonderful heart, 
Father, use him so that he can lead many to your kingdom. I pray for our sister, Heather Rowe, for her husband, that he may commit to your kingdom, Father, to your will. We pray that tonight, as he is in a hospital with chest pains, Father, that, Father, you heal him and you remind him that you are still there for him. I pray for my brother and sister, the Kapows, a man and woman that has been there alongside of us, our brothers. We pray that God will give them long lives and they may use them greatly for your kingdom. We want to pray for Nathan. He's a baby that he was born premature. And Father, I pray that tonight that you strengthen his body and that, Father, most of all, that he will grow up to be a man that follows you. We want to pray for Catherine Alonzo, for her lungs. Father, we pray that you open her lungs and that you restore her, Father, 100%. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory be to his name. Uh, we thank you for joining us tonight. And um, remember, you can visit us on our webpage, redemptionandpower.com, where we have available all of our podcasts. Or you can download the Radio Redemption and Power app, both for Android and iPhone. Or you can contact us at 305-320-7727. Remember, keep your eyes upon Jesus. He is the way. He is the life and the truth. He is the way that we ought to follow to be like Christ. And we reflect Christ as we abide in Christ, as we dwell with Him and fellowship with Him, then we start to look like Him. Thank you again for listening. May the Lord bless you. Every day the world is becoming darker and darker. Soon the Son of Man shall appear in glory and power, and the nation shall mourn for the sight of his coming. Are you ready for the return of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? As the armies of darkness march towards global domination, many slumber as we approach the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us awake and announce his kingdom. Trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. You are listening to Radio Redemption. And power! And power! Power! For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. 1 Corinthians 4.20 